What's happening? Uh, the world's happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do people yeah. from Long Island always say they're from New York? Uh... <laughs> are they referring to the state or the city? <laughs> well, we usually say the city. If we're talking about the city, but um, I guess I can refer to Long Island. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess uh, New York. Usually, people think of New York State. So, yeah, New York State comes right uh, about forty miles from here. And Long Island's uh, a little way away. Yeah, I think you're about. Seven and a half hour ride from me. Right. Going speed limit, of course, but <laughs> that'd be about five hundred miles or so. Yeah, close close to that. Well, it's the same ad- address you have on the, your site, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Then for me, it's yeah about seven and a half hours. So it's not too bad, actually. Right. You know. So I thought you were a little higher up. So. 330 feet, approximately. Okay. As long as you're yeah. on the shield, right? Eh? As long as you're on the shield, right? That's the... That's that's the key. Got to get to the shield. Yeah. Yeah. You can be in, uh, in Ontario, in some parts of Ontario, and not be on the shield. Right. And, uh... That that would be most of the area that looks like an arrowhead, right above yeah. Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, pointing at Lake Michigan. I think, if I remember, is um, all of Quebec is, uh, is is okay, right? That's to the east of you, right? Quebec, uh, uh, I don't know. I I I don't think it's all okay, but some of it is okay. I I wouldn't say that the people on the southern side of the St. Lawrence, right, behind uh, Maine and Vermont and side Moncton, I don't think that that would be okay. So it's not even just getting. North, but it's just it's getting on the shield, right? So That's it doesn't right. matter. It's it doesn't big, even matter if you're in Alaska because they'll. <laughs> right? yeah, it's, it's a big V, and it's uh, from Labrador down to um, uh, say Brockville. If you're making a point on the St. Okay. Lawrence River. Uh, and on the other side, it would be going up uh, the Trent Canal to uh, Lake Huron. And, okay. and across, there's a point in the province of Ontario where the line kind of swings sharply going towards Hudson's Bay. Well, you would be going past that point and up to the Northwest Territory, what is now called Nunavut, where there is Great Slave and Great Bear Lake. That would be about the boundary. Okay. Okay. Now, the shape uh, of it, as I've said before, is, is somewhat like Sherlock Holmes' hat, uh, where our area of Ontario would be the sun visor, and then up at around the 53rd parallel, it, it would be a circle around the Arctic, and on the other side, there would be a, a, a flap that takes in the Gobi Desert, Mongolia, hmm. the Gobi Desert. So, okay, okay. But some people describe it in another way, and put the flap, the the visor as Labrador, and the hat looking like a Russian Moscow hat has ear flaps. 
So we okay. would be one ear flap on the right-hand side of the visor, and there would be another ear flap on the other side of the Arctic, which would be the Gobi Desert, and it would extend uh, west um, to the line that is approximately um, Nebraska at a certain height. Wow. And she has about 1,000 feet below you, right? Yeah. Roughly? The Labrador, um, I think, is about uh, 6,000 feet high, and Kingston would be ground level for for the uh, Canadian Shield. So it's a slope that goes from Kingston up to Labrador. And at our place, in Ontario, we're about a thousand feet above the actual shield. Okay. And the the interesting item is that below us, uh, about 800 feet above the Canadian Shield, uh, is a stone structure uh, or a hmm. rock. Until we get there, we don't know exactly what it looks like. Uh, about 100 feet in thickness, which means that it would be equivalent to about a 10-story building. Right. Yep. And, uh, there's a relationship to a quote in the Bible that says, And on this rock I shall build my church. Yep. The suggestion is that the church is that rock below us, and that rock below us would be a um, storage center that would hold the secrets of mankind. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the basic knowledge of what they call their church. Wow. Well. And the secret that must be unveiled if we're ever going to stop this activity that is now going ahead uh, would be to find the, the thing of value that is within that structure below us uh, and... Uh, then prove to the world that the history they've learned is incorrect and that genetic engineering has been going on for a long time. I don't know if I told you the background of that is the story of Enoch. Yes, uh, last time you spoke about that. Yeah. So, so is that going to be, we have to have hieroglyphs on it? Is that how it would work? Or well, it out? In, in Enoch, it describes as God giving to Enoch um, a half of the stone he brought in, cut diagonally, which suggests it then becomes a triangle, right. and said that he would retain one half, give him the other half, and at was a point in time uh, when the two halves came back together again, um, the information about the world would be known to everybody. Um, everybody would know the truth type of thing. And one suggests that since the half that was given to Enoch was given to his son, and his son was Methuselah, the information received by Enoch and Methuselah has something to do with extending life through genetic engineering. In between the story of Methuselah living 960-some years and Enoch, there is the story of two other people, one that lived 300 years and another one that lived 700 and some years. Um, so the suggestion is the information tr 
transmitted was about how uh, genetic material could be used to clone an individual. And it's not really meaning that a person lived 300 years or 700 years. It means that from the genetic material received, they were able to make a new person who lived another so many years, and until they ran out, it took 300 years for the first one, took 700 and some years for the second one, hmm. and then Methuselah living 960 some years uh, becomes the the oldest they talk about. And my point is, uh, it's not that he lived 960 some years. It's that they were able to grasp the concept that the DNA itself and where it came from was important, and therefore, um, if if Methuselah's DNA uh, was stem cell rather than just uh, ordinary, uh, it can be replicated um, forever. Mm. And therefore, mm. there's no purpose in just saying, the, and the next guy lives 2,000 years and right. what have you. I so see. that stone, I suggest, was handed over to Joseph Smith. And it is the property of the Mormons and the reason why they're in Salt Lake City. Uh, because I suggest this, this thing began uh, at Lake Van in Turkey, which is a salt lake as well. Hmm. And uh, I'm going to... Salt Lake City, they, they went underground there and have established, from what I understand, a database of um, uh, people's genealogy. That would be important in the context of if you gen genetically engineer a person, that person has an impact on his descendants or her descendants for a period of four generations where by then the actual strength of the um, material passed down dissipates to the point where it becomes um, recessive not useful on a on a day-to-day -day basis that's basically what I'm studying now with uh, uh, using cats as opposed mm. to people because <laughs> it can be done easier and faster. Right, right. They don't argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, yeah. So I have about uh, 27, 28 cats, and, and there's always some dying and some coming forward, but it's interesting the project how starting off with two cats you can end up with uh, 28 hmm. cats and they're all different. Do any of them have defects? From I beg your pardon? Do any of them have defects? Yes. Uh, yeah. Some of them are born with birth problems that are common to cats and they die basically in a matter of uh, weeks or months. Mm, yeah. Had uh, I think about six cats go through that experience. Okay. Some of them have long hair, some short hair, some are uh, every color you can imagine from wow. black cats to white cats. And <laughs> Most of them are orange. Orange seems to be uh, a favorite color of uh, direct genetic engineering, and it's suggestive of uh, people with red hair. 
coming out of Mongolia would have been probably original material. Uh, and from the red, you get buff or blonde uh, or orange. If you remove some of the red from the orange, it gets to be brown or tan in color. Oh, okay. So it's it's quite um, fun to watch that right. entire process developing before your eyes. Now, what other animals do you have on the farm? One donkey. <laughs> uh, symbolic uh, here of uh, union leaders. Makes a lot of noise. Hides <laughs> behind the sheep. Uh, does uh, really nothing of significance except noise. <laughs> Is is really on side with the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it gets its cut. <laughs> its cut of hair. <laughs> and uh, we had we had four sheep, uh, but I didn't replace any as they got older and died, and I'm I'm down to one sheep, so I'm a one sheep herd. <laughs> That makes me a shepherd. A shepherd. <laughs> Are you a good shepherd? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> City boys don't make excellent country <laughs> people because you don't have it in your DNA. But uh, I probably am more attentive than than most. Uh, make sure that they have food and water. Right even if that means I have to carry it through a storm. Yep. I'm sure you get a lot of those up there, too, huh? Hey? I'm sure you get a lot of those nice wintry storms where yeah. you're living, right? Yeah, Although it's it's getting less and less for the last three years, so climate change yep. is having some impact, I think. Then we have, uh, uh, we had uh, three pigs for the first three years. And then the people who sold me the pigs found out who I was. And I guess they were Masons and, and didn't appreciate me. So they gave me three sick pigs. Oh, wow. Uh, so I, I, two of them died in the first couple of weeks. And the other one I killed but didn't uh, use any of its meat or anything. Right. Uh, yeah. And decided that... It, I wouldn't, there was no benefit after three years anyways of continuing the process. I found out about pigs, what I wanted to find out, and it had to do with their hair being short and bristly as opposed to long-haired cats and dogs, that kind of stuff. Right. And I found out that they're uh, very intelligent, very clean uh, yep. against what their reputation is. Uh, you know, for a guy born on a third floor apartment. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's now, I remember an interesting experience. I remember you, um, one of our earlier talks, you were, you were saying how you were in that, um, some hotel that had a room number 23 and a 14 room hotel. And yeah. then there was, then you saw, you know, you did, um, well, if you don't mind saying that story again, but I, I remember the point you were getting at was that there was the two vases, yeah. or vases. Now, is that, now I was, I've been thinking, now are the vases symbolic to a test tube? Is that what that's supposed to be? I was uh, trying to figure it out. Ha the it has uh, a couple of uh, meanings uh, that can be interpreted, and and all of this usually has more than one definition because they need deniability. If right. you find out one they need to tell you, it's the other type of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the vase is a um, um, symbol of a container. Back in the old days, there weren't many things that could be used for containers that would allow um, the retainment of, of liquid. Right. Um, it's interesting that a container... Uh, is a word uh, syllable in their tain, which is used in mountains, a mountain. 
mm. contain. And and the word pain basically means um, the back sheet on a sheet of glass that turns it into a mirror. Pain. So that a mountain and a container blocks your vision of what's really behind it. And, hmm. and therefore, um, the Chinese um, trying to demonstrate what would be the best uh, slave um, would use a vase to describe um, a person holding inside of it the information needed in genetics. Uh, but it was made of clay, a pot made of clay, which, which was pretty plain stuff. And right. they found a way to glaze the outside of it in the material they called, or we call, porcelain. And porcelain is suggestive of something on the outside that embellishes everything but denies you real knowledge of what's inside. And um, if if you use the word porcelain and break it down into its component parts, you have two parts. Uh, one is pork, P-O-R-C, which is pork in French. Rock, if you will, mm. uh, R-O-C. And the P is suggestive of end times. Len is uh, from the word line. Lins are lines. And glen is a G, len. Uh, and uh, a len uh, is a suggestive of a male where a lin is a suggestive of a combination. Uh, one instead of an E, I and E being key letters. Therefore, all of it is to say that in the end, that brought on the idea that a male could be used as the main structure a female could be used to cover the outside because it's a better marketing vehicle and it already has built-in abilities to replicate itself, although it would not be given the instruments to make eggs itself. It could, in fact, take an egg from a jar and insert it and then it would be fertilized because uh, hermaphrodite has a single testy. Uh, maybe it's considering the fact that the male inside testes could be the, the fertilizer agent in there. Hmm. Uh, and the whole would serve as a vehicle, the ultimate car for transporting Neanderthalers around. And hmm. the Neanderthaler wouldn't go whole, because whole lives in the Moho discontinuity, uh, but in the period they spent in Japan with the Jesuits in the 16th to 1800s and closed down the country, one <laughs> of the tasks uh, they were working on was miniaturization. And what the Neanderthalers wanted miniaturized 
symbolized by the bonsai trees, uh, hmm. is the medulla, pons, and uh, thalamus and hypothalamus and pituitary gland and all of that, so that it could be a structure small enough to be fitted into the neck area of this new slate. Of course, that's all symbolic of genome, genetic material that has to be assembled that will grow into that material or those parts of the body. And, and that, in the end, brought upon the, the final product that is to be the best slave, a male, five foot ten to six foot two, female exterior, capable of carrying a uh, fetus to term from egg on, and uh, uh, controlled robotically by a medulla fitted in the neck that would will the will of the Neanderthalers and not the will of the slave. So prior to this, there were, you know, they hadn't developed this into the neck of the slave, so people that lived before this time didn't have the Neanderthaler in the neck? They didn't have the Neanderthaler in the neck. They had uh, uh, male with female parts or female with male parts. So my suggestion is that uh, uh, the number six is the number used for female, and the number nine is the f uh, figure used for um, how you make something that resembles female but is not female. Uh, and the two put together are equilibrium, the flag of uh, Korea, uh, six and nine together. Right. Uh, whereas the male is a number eight. And the, the nine was constantly being worked on, and that's how you go from uh, male to homosexual, uh, from female to lesbian. Uh, cross-gender, all of those variations that were attempts at getting what they wanted uh, were considered to be number nine. But what we're seeing introduced this year is number 10. And number 10 is basically the first uh, finished versions uh, that they consider of the combination of the, tr the three, what they call triune, three in one. Right. And they had uh, basically done it in, in uh, some ways, um, Golda Meir, for example, being one example. Uh, at the other end of the scale, Carla Bruni gives you an idea of what they're working on in in appearance mm -hmm. or porcelain. But what they're really aiming for is the right balance for a world leader. And, and that balance at this stage of the game suggests that it would be uh, Hillary Clinton or Chelsea. Another example of the right balance would be um, Michelle Obama. Okay. okay. Michelle Obama is uh, is described as uh, that woman. That woman? Yeah. And in their language, they replaced the O with two E's 
Wee Man. Yeah. Bat Wee Man. All right, you posted that for the yeah. day. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Because two E's are symbolic of 88. So if male is an 8, an 88 is a male woman combined. Oh, right, right, right. Right, like an uppercase E with 88. Yeah. Mirrored on each other. <laughs> yep. Now, in sculpting, you must always be looking for the part that's missing. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, but um, but everyday people, they still have that piggy in their neck, or is that only something engineered for? Rules? I would suggest that by now, the process having begun in everyday people. In 1717, with the creation of secular Freemasonry, and having moved to the operational level in 1776 with uh, the Jesuits sending off a guy to pretend he was mad at them and and setting up the Illuminati, right. um, that we now have had over 200 years of uh, adding to the population. And I cannot see how that is not long, long enough to have completed the process. I believe that everybody by now is a, a product of either an original transfer of an egg that is 62% pure, or its offsprings over four generations. Wow. So if, if you had 200 years ago a population on the planet of uh, maybe a billion, the net result of the six billion we have today would all be descendants, right. and therefore should all come equipped. And now it makes sense why they try to get everyone into the city so that they can all just breed from the same people, right? Yeah. City Zans. <laughs> Zen. Easy. <laughs> the big easy. You make them into new Zams. <laughs> well, now, was the language to go back now? When um, how would the Neanderthalers and clan mothers communicate? If, you know, if they're just the suggestion is that the Neanderthalers uh, cannot speak in the normal sense of the word. Uh, Click language may be part of the description, but uh, certainly more likely would be pictographs. And uh, I don't uh, think there is much of a suggestion of intercourse having occurred between the two, although exceptionally speaking, that might have occurred. Uh, It's more a genetic engineering performed on clan mother by Neanderthals. Hmm. Okay. And the, the symbol, of course, is woman X chromosome and male you break off a leg make a Y chromosome and the variations in between when they were dealing with gays and lesbians and things like that would be how much of the broken leg is still there right that makes sense That's symbolic, of course. It all all translates to genome and 
much more complicated than I can deal with. I'm sure. That's just interesting to think that even, like, you know, for how long ago that was, or just being able to come up with technology that can even see genes and be able, to, let alone manipulate them. And, you, know. you have to think of it uh, not from our point of view, but from their point of view, uh, having been born at least 115, 120,000 years ago, some say 200,000 years ago, and others go further still, but if Neanderthaler was in fact a shrub type person with very, very high intellect as a group of people, uh, before they came in contact with the clan mothers, uh, which would have been uh, in 85,000 B.C., they had uh, a period, therefore, of at least 30,000 years to wow. perfect their understanding of genetics. They then lived with the clan mothers, not in the same room, but in the same general area, of um, uh, the Afar Triangle of Ethiopia and the Old Divai Gorge and all that area, uh, from 85,000 years B.C. to 58,800 B.C., which, again, gives you 30,000 years. So you have 60,000 years of knowledge, followed by uh, alpha test site. Then they go quiet for a period till about 40,000 B.C. When, when they leave the community of clan mothers and set up in what we call Somalia and continue their research there uh, of plants and minerals, and, and basically what you're dealing is alchemy. It's a mixture of chemistry and all other sciences. Uh, and they produce their serpents, which they call Cro-Magnon. And those serpents uh, are distributed uh, still to this day. Uh, in the southern part of Africa, below the Sahara Desert, as opposed to above the Sahara Desert. And uh, at one stage of the game, that's at 40,000 B.C., they made cro -Magnon. At one stage of the game, and the suggestion is between... 30,000 and 25,000 B.C. For a period of 5,000 years, they moved to an island called Madagascar mm -hmm. and have access to a few other islands which they can use as laboratories. Comoros Island, for example, off to the north, west of where they were on Madagascar, which are French islands today. And from that vantage point of Madagascar and the islands, they design a slave which is almost what we know as mankind today, called Roma, hmm. taking 
two letters out of Crow and two letters out of Magnum. Because non is is basically wisdom, genetic way of speaking, uh, Gnostic. Mm-hmm. So it's the 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 man of wisdom is is produced on uh, Madagascar. And then by 25 to 24,000 B.C., uh, they move to Antarctica. At the time, Antarctica is a continent much like North America is today with uh, great plains, grass, mountains with snow on top. Um, and it's it's a move that is done basically because it is the center of the planet. If if you look at the site uh, on the left hand side, I have a um, picture of Antarctica of of the Earth on which is focused on Antarctica, and if you click on it, it enlarges and it revolves, and you get to see that there is only one ocean in the world, and it all leads to Antarctica. Okay. It's like a big octopus. But once you look at Antarctica by itself, it's shaped like a rabbit. You have to let it turn till it gets to the right place. But you have a big white rabbit. And the white, of course, comes about with the coming of an ice age. An ice age is is a thing that happens on Earth on a semi-regular basis. And an ice age, I suggest to you, is something that is manufactured in outer space. Mm -hmm. If a body outside the solar system has a flyby period uh, which passes the solar system, it will have an effect on orbits within the solar system. And it will change the orbit from circular to egg shape. Right. That therefore means that all of the time the planet must spend in the the elongated part, it's colder because it's further away from the sun. But as it comes into the sun, it normally warms up and things melt. But then when it starts its journey up that slope again, it gets colder. And the more elongated the orbit is, the longer the period of ice uh, will uh, last. And the further down it will extend because it doesn't have a chance to melt and the less water there will be in the oceans as there is more and more ice and therefore more a possibility of moving across what we call straits today, Bering Strait, or right. the, the space between Antarctica and Australia, the space between uh, Sri Lanka oh, and India, uh, England and France. All of those things kind of become all linked together. But as the object moves further away from the sun, then the orbit of Earth returns closer to the shape of the circle. And as it does that, the temperature, mean temperature increases. Scientists tell us that the mean temperature changes 
two degrees, and that's all that's needed between no ice and an and ice age. And wow. um, there you go. We are basically, obviously, coming out of a period of some effect upon the planet. We're at the end of the ice age, not quite there yet, since um, we, we still have ice uh, in Antarctica and in the Arctic. Uh, however, it's getting shorter and shorter, their season, and, and is about to change. Uh, once the Earth returns to totally circular orbit, then there is no difference in climate anywhere on the planet. Oh. I thought it was because all the SUVs. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there you have the basic general structure of uh, the process. So with the coming ice age on Antarctica, 24,000 B.C. for 8,000 years to 16,000 B.C., it got colder. From 16,000 B.C. to 8,000 B.C., it got warmer. At about 13,000 B.C., as it was getting warmer, uh, it was possible for some Roma to be sent out and do some uh, exploration on the surface of the planet, getting straight their ground positioning, and I'm sure matching up surface areas with their uh, shortest tunnel distance from underground, so that they would know where they were popping up, wherever they were popping up, anywhere on the planet. Since the Moho discontinuity itself would completely encircle the mantle, you have the possibility of popping up anywhere. Um, and the usual route would be uh, an extinct cone volcano. Mm -hmm. Once they had done the exploration of uh, the planet, uh, they um, uh, basically began to populate it at about 8,500 B.C. until 4,000 B.C. And at 4,000 B.C., they established what... Um, is called the College of Six Days, which basically meant that they were opening a lab or a university, which would be the surface of the planet. And there would be a university within the university, the broader university being the entire planet. The narrower university would be the United States of America at the end time. Hmm. College of six days in their language means 6,000 years. So the time from Adam to zero and from zero to 2,000. Is that why they the run on that? The entire story is of genetic engineering, of course, yeah. starting with Adam. Take a rib and make a woman. Hmm. Is that why they run on that calendar? Yeah. And yeah. the moon is their year. So it's a, a lunar calendar and why the Catholic Church uh, always has their saints' days and stuff like that based upon the lunar year. It's, it's to cause confusion. They give one solar calendar to the people while they keep a lunar calendar for themselves and therefore can be talking about something different than what they tell us. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well. The word Jesuit is basically I am. Je suis. Mm -hmm. 
I am because I think is what René said. What was his name? Oh, um... Philosopher from France. Yeah, mental block right now. <laughs> yeah, I get these blanks too occasionally. But in any words, anyways, the word René just means reborn. So when they're talking about born again in the Christian Protestant churches. There's really two versions of that. Uh, the the version that they're selling is that uh, you can have everlasting life by giving them money. Of course. But, but in reality, without their help, you could have everlasting life if creation uh, decided to use your DNA over and over again, and along the way, the procedure being understood by uh, the one they call creator, gods, um, they also, through a system called intelligent design, or in science, genetic engineering, uh, could... Uh, model what creation can do. That's basically to store the DNA, divide it into its component parts, recombine it into uh, what you want the new species to be. Mm. For creation, it was basically from... Uh, chemistry into plant in, into uh, uh, bird into animal and into thinking human beings so creator stole the concept and wrote a religion around it and pretended to be creation and used uh, the knowledge they had gained in intelligent design to manufacture people who can be physically born again as creation had caused clan mothers to clone themselves they want a clone of their own but they want a new and improved version Hmm. Wouldn't it be interesting though if um, creation made the creators just to, for that purpose alone? Sure, it's it's always a possibility or uh, probability. Creation never experiencing anything um, can find things uh, more interesting could it experience? And you have a choice in believing it made it happen or, my preference, it let it happen. Right. And by letting it happen, it can experience through its own agents and bring them back. And its agents would be Cells within creation and how he, she, it, creation sneaks it into the lab so that it gets mixed in with creator's stuff um, is, is still uh, to be worked out by me. Everything comes eventually. Um, but um, Apparently, that's that's what happens, is that uh, every now and then, Creator uh, puts out a, um, 
product which is not totally in its control. Uh, I believe that has something to do with the shell being the basic structure of the original rather than a manufactured egg shell. Uh, but I still have work to do on that. It's not my priority. My priority is basically um, to try to make sense out of the whole thing, observe, analyze, conclude. And since I only carry part of the answers to assemble a critical mass that can attain all of the answers, and that critical mass, I suggest, is 13. Mm. I thought it would be an easy thing to do. Yes, Tom, I'm on the phone. Okay, supper's ready. Um, the the model, of course, is the orange. Uh, you can think of it as uh, balls of equal size around a single ball, or you can think of it as the orange, which has the seed in the middle right. uh, and uh, slices uh, twelve in numbers in a circle around protecting the seed in the middle. Uh, and you can think of uh, creator's version as a miniaturized orange, a clementine seedless. Hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, seedless. Yeah. So I'll have to leave you at that and, and go for my supper because the chef <laughs> the chef has spoken, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's All right. The only, well, the only time he speaks <laughs> <laughs> is when he says it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, enjoy and uh, thank you again. Okay. Bye for now. Okay.